This is unit one of our summer quarterly study, and our unit one is entitled, God is Just and Merciful. Uh, this is from our standard lesson commentary, and our study for this Sunday, June the 3rd, is entitled, Justice and Sabbath Laws. Our devotional reading for our lesson is Psalms number 10, our background scripture and printed text is Matthew the 12th chapter verses 1 through 14 and our key verse is Matthew 12 and 7 and it reads, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Our lesson's aims are summarize the incidents in today's text and Jesus' response in each case. Explain why mercy trumps sacrifice. Plan a merciful act towards a specific person in the week ahead. Our lesson for today is centered around the opposition that Christ faced as he began his mission work and fulfilling, fulfilling the prophecy and the promise of God to the people of the Old Testament and being fulfilled in the New Testament. And what we recognize is, is that in many instances that Christ faced opposition, uh, not from non-believers, but Christ faced opposition from what was considered in that day and time very devout religious practitioners and believers. So you would think there would have been a welcome committee or a reception that there would have been those that were ready to receive the fulfillment of God's promises and God's word. Yet there was rejection from those that were considered the known and knowledgeable and those that were teachers uh, of the word of God, of the holy writ, of the scripture. These were not uh, beginners in the faith. These were not upstarts as it has been said, but these were the chief priests of the synagogues and uh, the chief scribes and teachers and rabbis, and they were Christ's greatest opposition. So when we uh, indulge into our lesson, we will be centered around just one there were many instances, but our focus would be on just one, and this would be directed towards the Pharisees, which was one of the sects, one of the groups that were opposed uh, to the teachings of Christ. And many times they tried to entangle Christ with different traditional practices that they had devised themselves to try and discredit the works of Christ because they were threatened by the true fulfillment and teaching of the law. Our lesson uh, for this uh, particular incident that occurred where Christ was being challenged or questioned by a very pious religious group 
uh, known at that time as the Pharisees. And there are some references that say that this group consisted of about 600 members, uh, sorry, 6,000. 6,000 members, and these are some references that give us a numerical uh, sum of what the membership uh, looked like. But this group, the Pharisees, they had two practical obligations that they basically functioned from. And one was to observe with great strictness all the ordinances concerning ceremonial purity. The other was to be most scrupulous in the payment of tithes and other religious rites, other religious dues. Now, this group, they carefully relied upon oral traditions of the rabbis as well as the scripture itself to help them to interpret uh, their responsibilities. But sometimes they held tradition above the actual law. And this became one of the confrontations is, is that they relied more so upon established traditions and practices above what the law actually stated. Uh, this caused them to have more of a devotion and adherence to traditional practices that among their group they agreed upon based upon their interpretation of what scripture said and in accordance with what had become customary in their daily practices. So they begin to uh, assail their own indoctrinations greater and above that of what the law actually said. And this caused great contradiction and controversy. Once, once they begin to hear one who was fulfilling what the law said above what tradition and customary practices said. Now, to really get a gist for the character um, and the attitude of the Pharisees, uh, our background scripture, which will assist us in really tying and connecting the dots together through this passage in Matthew, uh, the 12th chapter. But our background uh, scripture or reading out of the number 10 of Psalms, uh, it would be uh, rewarding in your leisure if you would just read through the 10th number of Psalms. Um, to get more of insight into the character and the mindset of the Pharisees. I'm going to read just a few ver verses to kind of set the framework as we get into the scripture. The opening uh, statement to Psalms 10 uh, says, A plea for God's judgment. A plea. For God's judgment. And it reads, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boast of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, 
he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. Now, I've read verses 1 through 7, but I want to conclude towards the latter part of the number 10 of Psalms, starting at the 16th verse, and it reads, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. To justify the fatherless and the oppressed, the man of the earth may oppress no more. Now this gives us somewhat an insight into the confrontations and the controversy that occurs at the advent of Christ. Because those that have set themselves up within their own righteousness, or now there is an example that is present in front of them for all to see what true righteousness looks like what true righteousness does, how it judges. They prayed for the judgment of God to be in their midst, and Christ appears as the fulfillment of the request of the poor, the oppressed, and the needy. And this creates the great opposition that Christ is now confronted with. Now, our lesson opens up with uh, Christ and his disciples coming through a grain field, and it is on the Sabbath. And we know that uh, the Sabbath uh, has many connotations to it. Uh, the Sabbath uh, represented the day of rest. It was the seventh day. It was the day of completion. It was considered the finish of God's creative works. And as we uh, look at that, even tying it into the New Testament, it is still the finish and the completion of God's creative work. Because in the New Testament, the Sabbath still represents the day of observation. It represents the day of uh, recognizing and worshiping and setting aside time to praise and worship the creator. Uh, it's time for us to refrain from our daily uh, chores and activities and reserve some time that we can draw our minds in upon the one that made everything that is possible. So it still represents a day of observance, uh, completion, a finished work. But it also, through Christ, it also represents redemption and restoration and also a finished work and resurrection. So, but... The Pharisees had set aside that uh, it was not customary to do any work on the Sabbath, uh, that uh, that was sacrilegious. And so in order that they could discredit the works of the one who fulfills the law of God, and when we speak of the law of God, we're not speaking of just actual written words in texts, but we're speaking of the foundational fundamentals and principles that govern the order of God's creation. And our lesson focuses, draws more attention towards the underlying uh, title in our lesson, 
is based upon mercy and God's generosity. Although it is titled that God is just and merciful, and our lesson is focused on justice and the Sabbath laws, but underlying that is the mercy and the generosity of God. So the Pharisees tried to entrap him and say, we see that uh, your disciples went through the grain yards and uh, they were eating. Uh, that uh, is a direct uh, disobedience that's uh, conflicting with uh, keeping the Sabbath holy. Uh, now the Pharisees, when we begin to talk about uh, traditions and we begin to talk about oral traditions, as I read earlier, uh, we begin to see that certain groups, uh, certain pious groups, they begin to add certain amendments, certain additions to a term in law. And they segment it, break it down, and then they begin to divide it into certain criteria where now they can pick apart different little tangible things and then try to enforce the abundance of the law on every little small act. But here is how the Pharisees had broken this down. And uh, they said, well, there were like three kinds of work that the disciples had already been in violation of. So they said, well, by them going through the grain fields and plucking uh, the stalks and beginning to eat from that, well, the first thing was is that they were reaping. So they were plucking the grain. And then there was threshing, which was rubbing the grain to separate the kernel from the husk. And then there was winnowing, uh, which was blowing the husk away from the grain. So as they were trying to entangle Christ in this, then Christ's response to them was to take them back to 1 Samuel, uh, the 20th chapter, uh, verses 1, starting all the way through to the chapter, it, it gives you a understanding of why David was allowed to go into the tabernacle and take the showbread that was reserved for only the priest. But it explains here how that Saul was actually after David to murder him, to kill him. And David went into conversation with Jonathan, who was Saul's son. And although Saul tried to attempt to kill David three times, David began to flee uh, for the safety of his life. And he made a covenant with Jonathan that he was, his life would be spared and Jonathan would protect him. And so when we get into the 21st chapter of uh, Samuel 1, uh, in the six verses where David is allowed to go into the tabernacle and to take of the showbread, him and his companions, because he was basically, in present terms, he was a fugitive. And uh, he was running and he was fleeing for his life and there was no... A uh, real stopping point as an abundance of food for his physical needs. So Christ brings this up. And uh, uh, he also talks about how that, well, although they bring up the issue about the Sabbath, he also brings up the fact that while we say that no one is to work or do anything that exerts any kind of energy uh, on the Sabbath, but just keep it holy and unto the Lord. But he also brings out the fact that the priest, they work on the Sabbath because the priests are serving the congregation. So he says that even though that, you know, we're trying to say nobody should be doing anything, but the priests are working 
because they are taking sacrificial offerings. They're still functioning in the tabernacle. They're still advising. They're still adhering to the needs of the congregation. So uh, everyone is not exempt from working on the Sabbath. And then he gives us the classic uh, response, uh, which is found in Mark and in Luke, uh, where he says that, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, not to uh, prolong uh, our lesson, because it pretty much is self-explanatory, but it, it gives us some kind of a, a notion, an insight into how those in power. Now, the Pharisees were a powerful, influential group, but they worked behind the scenes. They were not really a political party. They were a religious sect, a religious organization with influence to people who were in political positions. And so when we look at this, Sometimes we wonder why certain officials that are elected, that they vote in certain ways because they've been elected by their constituency, by the registered voters. But yet when they get in office, they don't vote the way or in favor of their constituency, but they begin to vote in other ways that benefit other groups who are the machines, the mechanisms behind the scenes influencing what the elected officials will do while they're in a place of service for the people at large. So as we go forth, Christ begins to bring to them the understanding of that um, there's a man here who needs healing. And this man was found uh, in the synagogue. The synagogue was a place that basically was developed uh, from the Babylonian captivity. But this man is, has a shriveled hand. He has a hand that is uh, not normal. And so as Christ is being questioned about what he allowed his disciples to do, the shriveled man is viewed and Christ recognizes that this man needs healing. And so to bring to their attention that he is the Lord also of the Sabbath, then he brings to their attention that while you all are again critiquing my actions, if you had a sheep that was found in a pit, would you not go over and remove that sheep from the pit for the sake of no harm coming to the sheep? And he gives all of those that were in viewing and hearing of this scenario of what's taking place, he gives us an insight into the attitude of those in their own self-righteous domains. And that is, is that here in this instance, they cared more for the sheep than they did for a human. They cared more for a sheep who was not injured, but had just fallen into a pit. But here was a man who had a disability, and they would rather free the sheep from a low pit than help a man that had a disability. And so Christ puts the focus on their state of mind 
that they cared more for an animal. And I'm not one that is uh, against uh, the improper care of animal. All life, all of God's creation is sacred. God didn't make anything that does not have a purpose and a function. But what we're looking at here is the attitude that they would do more for a stock from someone in uh, an entity in a herd than they would for another human being. So as uh, we close our lesson, uh, it said that we should think about somebody that we were going to show forth some mercy and generosity to in the week coming forth. So we hope that something has been said that will provide you with some needed instruction on what should be our state of mind and our attitude, even on the Sabbath. If a need presents itself, what should be our response? God bless you and God keep you as always is our prayer.